I call the members to order and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister and the first question, Janet Finch Saunders. First Minister, make a sta statement on tackling rural crime. Yes, we work closely with Welsh Police Forces, Natural Resources Wales and local authorities to prevent and tackle rural crime and to help make people feel safer both at home and in public <coughs> places. Thank you, First Minister. Rural crime, of course, costs the rural economy over £2 million each year. In North Wales, we have a very hard-working rural crime team working with other agencies, but they estimate that 75% of their workload is related to livestock crime. In three years, 2,000 sheep have been killed in 400 separate dog attacks. They tackle vehicle theft, rural business theft, as well as badger baiting and animal abuse. Will you endorse with me here today and support the excellent work carried out by the North Wales Rural Crime Team and pledge your support and any um, additional resources that might be available for their sterling work going forward? Well, but, but bear in mind, of course, that, uh, that, that uh, policing is not devolved and therefore funding uh, largely comes from the, uh, the Home Office. But I can say that, of course, we support the team. The Cabinet Secretary met with the team on the 15th of June uh, and received an update on the scale of the issue, uh, the response that they had uh, uh, put in place and also the work ongoing to change the law at the UK level. Rhiannon Passmore. Yeah. First Minister, in Islaan we face on the historic Tumbalam Tump, the scourge of fly tipping, and it costs Wales nearly two million each year in clean-up costs, which ultimately has to be paid by the taxpayer. This rural crime is harmful to human health and spoils the enjoyment of our stunning countryside. Since 2007, Welsh Government has funded Fly Tipping Action Wales, an initiative coordinated by National Resources Wales and involving over 50 partners working to together to tackle fly tip tipping through education. What does the Welsh Government believe are the actions needed to achieve our vision of combating this menace? Firstly, a change of attitude and culture so that uh, some people, those who do fly tip, realise how antisocial it is. Secondly, of course, enforcement uh, and working with Natural Resources Wales and local authorities and the public, indeed, to make sure that happens. And thirdly, of course, through uh, enforcement of penalties. Uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, we've looked at introducing fixed penalty notices for small-scale fly tipping uh, incidents. That provides local authorities with a more efficient and proportionate response to low-level, high-volume uh, offences, uh, but, of course, for those who are uh, more serious and more serial offenders, uh, then, of course, they can be prosecuted uh, within the law. But, of course, this does depend on intelligence coming uh, from the public in order to provide the evidence in the first place. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Llywydd. This week, David Powys Police and Aberystwyth University are carrying out a study of rural crime to try and gather evidence because we believe that rural crime costs more than some of the figures quoted to date. Would you join with me in encouraging farmers to contribute to that study and congratulate David Powys Police for using sheep DNA for the first time ever to ensure that someone will face prosecution and be found guilty for sheep rustling and that this is an exciting development in the area of rural crime? Well, yes, of course I will, because it's vital that we can secure more evidence so that people can be prosecuted. But, of course, the police and every authority are dependent on the information that they receive from farmers and others living in the rural areas so that they can augment that evidence. Question two, Lear Griffith. Will the First Minister make a statement on sports infrastructure in North Wales? Yes, there are a number of first-class sport facilities in North Wales which serve both elite and community sport and Sport Wales, our key delivery agent, is working with partners to ensure there is appropriate provision across Wales. Thank you for that response. It was interesting to note that your Cabinet Secretary for the Economy was very eager to see the development of a convention centre in Cardiff recently, although we have the Millennium Stadium, the Cardiff City Stadium, Motor Point Arena, we have the Millennium Centre, we have a convention centre in Newport just down the road, we have the Liberty Centre in Swansea, there's a similar development in the pipeline in Swansea and good luck to them. 
I don't depre uh, de deprecate that at all, but there is a question on government investment in proposals in North Wales and North East Wales, particularly the race course, for example, is eager to develop itself as an international sports facility. It's also eager to hold events. Ollie Mers was there over the weekend with many thousands in attendance, but the feeling is that the investment isn't forthcoming. So the question, First Minister, is when will we see your government being as proactive and eager to encourage that kind of development somewhere similar to the race course? Well, you listed some places there that are not supported by the government, namely the arena in Cardiff and the arena in Swansea. But you raised the question about the race course. We wish to ensure that that is developed ultimately, but it's very important that the race course themselves put projects forward because we, of course, can't establish our own projects without collaborating with those people already in the town and the vicinity. I know that the Supporters Trust from Wrexham Football Club have submitted a report to Welsh government officials in order to progress this process and we are very eager to collaborate with them. The premier sports facilities in North Wales, of course, is Park Arius in my own constituency, the home of uh, Rugby Gogleth Cymru. And it's, I've been very pleased, actually, to see the Welsh Government's investment uh, in that site uh, over the years. But would you agree with me uh, that if we're to have uh, great sports facilities, we've also got to make sure that we've got the transport infrastructure to get people in and out of those uh, facilities? One of the problems we have, uh, of course, in North Wales is that A55 corridor and the congestion that occurs on it uh, from uh, time to time and I wonder what uh, action you're going to take to make sure that those sporting venues have adequate transport infrastructure around them. Well, how topical uh, the question is from the, uh, the member, because I see that money has been made available for specific projects to the uh, Northern Ireland executive, and Wales is not being treated in the, uh, in, in the same uh, way. We'd be more than delighted to take forward more measures on the A55 to reduce congestion. If only we were in a position where we had DUP members who could be bought by the Conservative government. Questions now from the party leaders. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Arty Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, this morning the Cabinet took the decision to not proceed with the funding package for the Circuit of Wales, and I appreciate the Minister will be making a statement uh, later on this afternoon. Yesterday, the most senior civil servant in the Department gave evidence to the Public Accounts Committee where he talked of this project having a very high-impact project in the status that it was held with uh, in the Department, and he also said it did deliver value for money, and these, these are his words. I'm quoting to you, and it was a project that was ready, subject to finance, to be delivered. Now, the Cabinet Secretary, with his statement this morning, says that actually the claims around the project were significantly overstated, and he says, historically, there is little evidence on an international scale of any track on its own acting as a catalyst for further local employment. Those two statements from the senior civil servant and from the cabinet secretary are completely opposed to each other in the views that they're trying to create. Who's right and who's wrong when it comes to this project? No, they're not, because phase two uh, of the project is a technology park. That is something that we will proceed with as a government. That is the project that would have delivered the vast majority of the uh, jobs. Unfortunately, uh, the conditions that we uh, laid down as far as the circuit itself was concerned could not be fulfilled by the, uh, by the company uh, concerned. Uh, we wanted to make sure they had sufficient time to look to fulfil those conditions, but unfortunately that proved not to be the case. I'm afraid that's not what the statement that came forward from the Cabinet Secretary this morning indicated. As I said in his written statement, he says that there is little evidence of a project like this delivering uh, on the numbers that have been talked about. In fact, it actually talks of only 100 whole-time equivalent jobs being delivered on the circuit. I take that, and there is a park alongside it. But actually, the, the, per, the Permanent Secretary in that department said yesterday that it was a project ready to be delivered. He had confidence, and again, reiterating his words it was a very high impact project so obviously he had confidence in the project your government at the 11th hour withdrew its support for this project you've offered a fig leaf by saying that you're going to reinvigorate the enterprise zone in Ebervale 
which has to date delivered very little investment to the area, I go back to the point, how can there be two wide-ranging statements, one from the Cabinet Secretary, one from the most senior civil servant, that are so opposed in the views of this project? I think the public deserve a greater understanding of why it has taken five years to get to this point. I think he answered his own question by saying subject to finance, and that is the, uh, the, the issue here. We wanted to offer the circuit every opportunity to meet the conditions that we had stipulated. They weren't able uh, to meet uh, those uh, conditions, and so, uh, as a result of that, the financial uh, situation was not right for us to be able to support this scheme for the circuit. What we can, however, do is to deliver the vast majority of the jobs by delivering the technology park. We've spoken to uh, potential investors. We've spoken to those in the industry. They are uh, interested. Uh, they want to, uh, to work with us on the uh, technology park. So, Yes, there are, there are jobs to the tune of four figures uh, that can be delivered with, as that technology park is taken forward. It's not dependent on there actually being physically a racetrack there. Well, you will not be delivering the vast majority of the jobs as proposed in the original concept because there were 6,000 jobs proposed around this project. In the park. And the actual park that you are talking about delivering is a potential of 1,500 jobs with a 10-year delivery programme for that park. So there is a dislocate. But the point I am driving at here, First Minister, is you have the Permanent Secretary in that department at complete loggerheads with the Cabinet Secretary in his interpretation. The evidence is there from the Public Accounts Committee of this project, and again, I repeat, a very high-impact project. So that is finance, that is jobs, that is regeneration. Otherwise, why would he have used such language? Do you have confidence in James Price's ability to continue within his role, or are you back in the Cabinet Secretary? It is frankly cowardice. Cowardice for any member in this chamber to name a civil servant in that way when they cannot respond. It is cowardice. I ask the Leader of the Welsh Conservatives to withdraw it. I would like to reply to that because well, to accuse I, I, someone of cowardice. I, 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 no, no, I that think is out it of order, the is probably inappropriate for you to be naming a civil servant in this place when that civil servant is not able to be here to answer for himself. So I, I'm, I'm going to move on uh, now and call the leader of UKIP, Neil Hamilton. We're not going to move on very far, Shahid, I'm afraid, <laughs> because I'm going to uh, continue the line of questioning by the leader of the, the Welsh Conservatives. Isn't it now absolutely clear why this decision has been delayed until after the general election? Uh, and what the Welsh Government has done today is actually to kill the hopes of the people of Blaenau Gwent and uh, a much wider area. There is nothing that uh, the government was able to discuss this morning that couldn't have been discussed weeks ago. There's nothing new at all in this decision. Uh, and uh, the limit of the Welsh government's obligations would be a maximum of £8 million a year for 33 years, as once all the buildings on the site were constructed. It's not that so the whole thing would be telescoped up front and the money would have to be found tomorrow or within the next three years. And therefore, what this shows is a pathetic lack of vision on the part of the Welsh Government to kill this massive private enterprise scheme, which offered not just hope to one town in Wales, but actually to the whole of South East Wales. Uh, it's difficult to be lectured by somebody who was part of a Conservative administration who closed down the, the late last mine, for example, Marine Six Bells in, uh, in Blaenau Gwent, and was more than happy to, to do so. Um, I mean, really, I can't take what he says in that regard uh, seriously. The reason why the decision couldn't be taken at the time he mentions is because the due diligence process hadn't finished. Or is he suggesting that decisions should be taken before all the information is, is ready? That is reckless, to say the, uh, to say the least. Uh, and uh, he, he fails to understand the, the, what is behind this project. The jobs were in the technology park, not in the circuit. The circuit only provided jobs to the region of about 137 full-time jobs. That's it. The rest of it, the, the thousands of jobs, were always going to be in the technology park and beyond. And that is exactly what we're going to invest in as a government. It's also wrong to say that this is simply £8 million over the next 33 years. We know, having explored this with ONS, who would refer this to Eurostat, that there's a very high risk of this guarantee being regarded as being on the balance sheet. That means uh, we would lose £373 million of capital funding. £157 million would have to be found this financial year. That is, schools not being built, hospitals not being modernised, houses not being built. Now, surely he has to accept that that high risk cannot be ignored. 
No, what we're talking about here is a bean counters convention. It's not, it's not, it, 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 is, it, is, it, it, it is nothing new. Uh, we, we knew in advance uh, of the decision being taken, months and months ago, what the ONS rules and the Treasury rules on how to treat uh, long-term spending of this kind were. So, so this, this is something which could have been decided a very long time ago. Why has the Welsh Government allowed this project to limp along for six years when that could have been recognised right from the start? What we need to do here surely is to change the accounting convention rather than to destroy the hopes of those who were relying upon regenerating the whole of South East Wales. Because if it is the case that it is only the rules of the Office for National Statistics and Her Majesty's Treasury in London which has killed this project, then that is an absolute disgrace. <laughs> we, we can't change the rules. The rules are set by ONS. They are independent of government and they set rules uh, in conjunction with, with Eurostat, and we have to be uh, aware of what that risk might entail. He calls it a bean counters convention. The risk is far greater than that. If we end up with £370 million on our books, that means it's capital money we cannot spend. Uh, and surely uh, he will understand. He's been in government, surely he understands this. He will know that that is a risk that any government must take seriously. He, may, he asked the question as to why this wasn't identified before. This was part of the conditions. The conditions stipulated 50-50. The conditions haven't been met. That's why it's a problem. All the money which is going to be provided up front to build the circuit of Wales is private sector money. All that the Welsh Government is being asked to do is to guarantee payments which will be made to the senior bondholders for less than half the capital employed in a period which only starts when the whole site has been developed. So there are physical assets then against which the contingent liability of the government would be secured. What we have now is a proposal from the government to spend £100 million over 10 years, shed loads of money on a series of empty sheds. No. We, we have already assessed the demand, spoken to businesses. We know there is a demand for premises in the heads of the valleys. Uh, and we know that there are uh, uh, businesses who cannot move there because the premises aren't there. So it's hugely important to make sure that we provide those premises as part of the technology park that is part, actually, of the circuit itself. The only thing in many ways that's missing is the actual racetrack. The jobs, the vast majority of the jobs, are still there. He is not being honest with himself when he says this is only about a guarantee. He knows full well that if £373 million are reprofiled so they appear on our books, we lose the money. It's the same as a cut. It means we would have to find £157 million in this financial year. The problem we have is that we have pursued this with ONS and with Eurostat and the, uh, with, Euro, with ONS, and their answer is we cannot give you a definitive ruling until we've seen the final contract. It's too late by then. That's the problem. So the real risk here is that we end up not moving ahead with projects in year that people have already been promised because of, yes, an accountancy device, but one nevertheless uh, that the ONS have identified and one which carries a high risk. Arwenydd Plaid Cymru. Cymru leader Leanne Wood. Um, I think you do have some further questions to answer about this, but I understand there's an urgent question coming later. So I'd like to ask you about another aspect of the economy, and that is in relation to education and skills. Many concerns have been expressed to me by teachers about their workload and linked to that growing sickness rates. Many people are considering leaving the profession now. Initial teacher training levels have been described as bordering on crisis. Do you agree? No, I don't. Uh, I think there are great opportunities for us when paying conditions are devolved to put in place a holistic package for teachers to make sure that the responsibilities they have are reflected in terms of the pay that they receive. It, it's always been a strange anomaly uh, that we have responsibility for education but not for paying conditions. That is at the heart of delivering a good deal for teachers and that's, that's what we intend to do. Well, perhaps if you'd had unity on the question of devolving pay and conditions within your own party before now, we might have got somewhere uh, with that. But I'm concerned about your refusal to face reality. I'm not really surprised, but uh, I am concerned. First Minister, the words I used, crisis, were not my own words. They were the words used by the NUT. 
Back in April, Plaid Cymru warned that teacher recruitment was heading for a perfect storm. We are now in the middle of that storm. The secondary school intake for trainee teachers has dropped a third below the target. Now, that target is based on need, the number of teachers we need in our system. There's now a gap of around 280 secondary school teachers. And intake for primary school teachers has also now dropped below the target. We know from the Education Workforce Council that one third of teachers intend to leave the profession within the next three years. First Minister, in March, changes to teacher training were announced. How long is it going to take for those changes to stop this downward trend? I don't think it will be possible to put in place the right package until pay and conditions are devolved. Why? Well, people want to know what their terms of employment are, what their conditions of employment are, what they'll be paid, uh, what the, what, for what activities they'll be paid for. And that all impacts clearly on a decision to go into a, a profession. That impacts ultimately on numbers. Now, Next year, we will have a, the, the opportunity and the responsibility uh, of controlling teachers' paying conditions. We want to work with the teaching unions to make sure we put forward a package that makes teaching more attractive uh, than perhaps it has been for, for some people in the past. But getting control of peer paying conditions is absolutely crucial to that. So you're kicking, off, kicking it off again into the future then. The situation, First Minister, is worse than you were prepared to admit. The overall number of trainee teachers has dropped every single year since 2011, and the correspondence and conversations that I've had with teachers shows that there is a deep problem here. From your answer, I'm not convinced at all that you've got plans to treat this uh, situation with any sense of urgency. What I want to see is our teacher, teaching profession supported. Why don't you talk to teachers and their trade unions and ask them what can be done in the immediate term to help with their workload and their mental well-being? You're putting things in place now which may well pay off in the future, but that decline in numbers has been evident for several years now. It's not a new problem, and the crisis is here and the crisis is now. You have previously admitted that you took your eye off the ball in education, and at that point in time you indicated that your government would up its game. Since you have made that admission in education, what exactly have you been doing? Well, we can see GCSE results the best ever, A level results going up, new schools being built all across uh, Wales, the attainment gap closing, the people deprivation grant making uh, a huge difference. And I mean, a slightly bizarre comment from the leader of Plaid Cymru suggesting we don't talk to teaching unions. I mean, the, the, response, the response from the, uh, the, the cabinet secretary was, uh, was uh, I think, audible to, uh, to most in the chamber, in order, but, but audible. Uh, that's what she does. Uh, and the link between ourselves and the teaching unions is strong. But we all recognise that in order to uh, put in place the right package for teachers, we need to get that one last piece of the jigsaw, which is paying conditions. We've got it, and then it will be our responsibility. That's true. Question three, Hannah. Question three, Hannah Blythe. Mr. Minister, provide an update on how the Welsh Government is supporting people living with dementia in North East Wales. Well, we provided nearly £8 million extra a year to improve dementia services in Wales. Uh, in line with our Taking Wales Forward commitment, we've also been working closely with stakeholders to develop a dementia strategic action plan, which will be published in the autumn. Thank you, First Minister. I welcome the Welsh Government's commitment to supporting people living with dementia and their families. And you're right to say that um, at the core of any strategy and action plan, it must be those people who are the experts, or the people who are actually living with dementia, their carers and their, or their families, to be at the, the core of that. Um, priority has to be given to make sure that people living with dementia live as well and for as long as possible. And for that to happen, we need to have the resources to support, educate and empower. And on that, I'm pleased that two towns in my constituency, Mould and Flint, now have the status of dementia-friendly towns. And more and more things like memory cafes are cropping up across the county. And Flintshire County Council are working, amongst other things, um, to accrediting more businesses um, with working towards dementia being dementia friendly status with status and pledges of action and on that note last week um, I, I myself and all my staff um, completed dementia friends training even with someone who has got a close relative living with dementia that certainly opened my eyes to things as part of that training so can I ask first minister that will the Welsh government commit to working towards um, businesses and organizations and create, making sure that more businesses and organizations across the country do have that dementia friendly status and will you join with me in encouraging those assembly members who haven't taken up the offer from the Alzheimer's Society to do dementia friends tra training to do that so that we can actually get to a point where we can say all assembly members and their offices in Wales are dementia friends. Uh, yes, well, I was at an event myself uh, a week last Friday where um, 
the Alzheimer Society were, were present. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the issues uh, surrounding uh, being a, becoming a dementia friend uh, and the, the training that's required to do that. And of course, as a government, we, uh, we support that. Dementia cafes, we know, provide people with dementia, their families and carers, the opportunity to meet in a friendly and relaxed environment where they can share experiences and, of course, offer peer support, hugely uh, important as well. Now, expanding the availability of that support is an example of what we're looking to achieve uh, through the forthcoming Dementia Strategic Action Plan. Janet Finch Saunders. Yeah. First Minister, it is shocking to know that for half of those living with dementia in Wales, an initial um, delayed diagnosis is a serious issue, affecting themselves and, of course, their loved ones. Alzheimer's Society Cymru have called for far more ambitious targets and interventions in this area. The Society have also called for earlier diagnosis rate targets to increase annually as part of your government's forthcoming revised dementia strategy. Will you ensure that that overall aim and goal to allow for earlier diagnosis and intervention becomes a reality? Mm. Hugely important. Uh, we know that in BCU, for example, about 49% of individuals with dementia have a diagnosis. Uh, difficult initially, and sometimes people themselves, if they have no one who can recognise it for them, don't recognise it. But important that, that, that uh, diagnosis is, uh, is available. I know that BCU, for example, have begun work on developing a new local strategy for people with dementia, addressing the wide range of services that are uh, required. And that work, of course, involves working with dementia groups. Michelle Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, dementia is incredibly hard on the family members who put their own lives on hold to care for a loved one with dementia. Um, care has become very tired and stressed. It's a very traumatic thing to have to do to look after somebody with dementia because effectively you're seeing them slip away piece by piece. Um, how are you ensuring that adequate and consistent provisions being put in place by local authorities and health boards to support the needs of such carers in terms of respite care, advice and counselling? Well, in addition to what I have just said to the uh, Assembly, the mental health measure places a statutory requirement on all LHBs and local authorities to provide those with a diagnosis of dementia who need specialist mental health care with a care and treatment plan designed around their needs and those of their carers. moves quickly, Pedro. seamlessly on. Question, Pedro. Question for Simon Thomas. Thank you, Chloe. What discussions have the Welsh Government had regarding reducing the escalating problem of excessive gambling? While the regulation of gambling is not devolved, we are exploring what more we can do to tackle problematic gambling and the impact it has. Evening, dog. Thank you, First Minister. Although you say that gambling itself isn't devolved, the impact certainly are devolved in health, mental health and the economy and runs into tens of millions of pounds in terms of its impact in Wales annually. There is some devolution happening around the fixed odds, odds machines and there will be more demand for the Welsh Government to respond to this challenge. So what are you likely to do over the next year or two to ensure that independent research, independent, uh, research that isn't reliant on the gambling industry itself, is available to you as a government to ensure that you measure the impact of gambling appropriately and accurately for our communities? Well, good work is being undertaken by bodies across Wales, but we, of course, see gambling as a problem and a problem uh, relate, which is related to mental health because people, can't, people are, become addicted. The chief medical officer is leading on work in this area and, of course, we look forward to seeing his recommendations later on this year. And, of course, those recommendations will be something that we can build on in order to deal with these problems. Uh, I, too, would like to see uh, further devolution in respect of responsibility for gambling here uh, to Wales. But we do have some powers uh, already, including powers through the planning uh, system, whereby we could take action to prevent the proliferation of uh, licensed betting shops uh, in uh, small uh, communities. We know that there's a proliferation, particularly in deprived communities, of, uh, of gambling uh, outlets, and that can be a a particular problem. I wonder what action the Welsh Government will consider taking through the planning process to address this issue. 
In terms of the planning process, I mean, he is right to identify that there has been a, a growth, uh, it seems to me, in <coughs> betting shops over the years. That's only part of the problem. Online gambling is a major, major issue as well, uh, and if people are gambling online, they're particularly hard to, uh, to reach. Uh, if I could write to him uh, on the issue of the, the planning process and how that deals uh, with gambling, well, I will do that, <coughs> providing with a detailed answer. Question Pimp Dialogue. Question 5, Di Lloyd. Thank you, Llywydd. Will the First Minister outline Welsh Government plans to support individuals who suffer from hearing loss? The Welsh Government published an integrated framework of care and support for people who are deaf or living with hearing loss last month. This sets out our plan to improve the provision of health and social care services and support to ensure high-quality care across Wales. Thank you very much for that response, First Minister. And further to that, perhaps you'll know of the Hear to Meet project presented by Action on Hearing Loss has come to an end, and this means that there will be a decline in support for individuals with hearing loss across Wales. As a result of that, is your government willing to collaborate with organisations such as the Wayne's Council for the Deaf and others to close the gap that appears because of the loss of this important project. A conference was held last Friday in Swansea, which was a national audiology conference, and the, sci the chief scientific consultant was present, giving a presentation at that conference and of course I've emphasised the integrated framework of care and it's clear that there is a great deal of support for this work and so it's important that the framework itself moves forward and that we ensure that it ha does have an impact on people's lives. Uh, thank you. Um, I know the First Minister is aware that um, deaf children and children with uh, pure, poor communication skills are more likely to be the target of abuse than other children. And in January, in a short debate, I highlighted the abuse suffered by children at a special school for deaf children in Llandrin Dodwells in the 1950s, where sadly it was the children with poor speech skills who were being targeted, and that issue is being uh, pursued. But what mechanisms are in place um, to make um, educational professionals aware that these children uh, with hearing loss are often targeted and what measures are in place to ensure they are adequately protected from such abuse in the future? Ultimately, of course, it is a matter for schools to determine uh, to, to ensure that, that bullying does not occur within schools. But the additional learning needs bill, if passed, will completely overhaul the system for supporting pupils with additional learning needs including learners with hearing impairments. Uh, it will obviously put the learner at the heart of that process uh, and make it simpler for those uh, involved. There will be finance, of course, to support the bill. Uh, and as part of the narrative around that bill, uh, I would want to make sure that uh, the issue or, uh, that the bullying is dealt with as part of that narrative. Yes, it is important to support those with additional learning needs, but in, a, in, in the widest way possible, including, of course, protecting them from bullying. Paul Davis. Uh, First Minister, it's important the Welsh Government does create the right conditions in order to develop an education workforce that is able to provide for a broad range of additional learning needs, including those suffering from hearing loss. And I'm sure you'll be aware of the demands to add British Sign Language to the national curriculum. So can you give us an update on the most recent developments to add British Sign Language to the curriculum? And can you tell us what the Welsh Government is doing to encourage businesses to learn BSL in order to make local services as accessible as possible to all, including those who are deaf or living with hearing loss? Well, there are standards as regards accessing the health service, and of course we expect that process to be followed. As regards ways in which we can promote businesses or encourage businesses to use or to present services that can be used by these groups, we would wish to work with those groups to ensure that that does happen and we must ensure that BSL is available where possible. As regards the place of BSL within the curriculum, I will ask the Minister for Education to write to the member to give him more details. Question six, Neil Hamilton. Make a statement on social care in Mid and West Wales. 
Well, social care is a sector of strategic importance. We provided an extra £55 million of recurring funding for social services. The regional partnership boards have completed their population needs assessment and continue to deliver integrated care funded through the uh, Integrated Care Fund. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And we all appreciate the uh, financial challenge that social care will pose for us in the, the future. Uh, we have a situation in North Keradigion now where the Council has announced the closure of a care home called Bodlondeb. Uh, this has come as a boat from the blue. Nobody knows where the residents will be sent to. There is no social care plan for North Keradigion, um, yet there is a consultation going on over the closure of this home. Is it not uh, unfair upon those who are placed in this position that uh, uh, there is this uncertainty? And the council has spent apparently two million pounds uh, on Price Waterhouse Cooper's advice on 12 to 14 million pounds worth of council cuts. Does this not seem a sort of bizarre priority when the real needs of real people are going by the board? Well, I understand there will be a consultation on the closure of Bodlondeb uh, until the, or it'll carry on until the 25th of September. It is a very difficult time, obviously, for all of those who are concerned. Can I say to the member that the safety and well-being of residents is my main concern, and the Care and Social Services Inspectorate will be working closely with the Council to ensure this is carried out throughout the process. Angela Burns. Uh, First Minister, the recent Mid and West Wales Health and Social Care Regional Collaborative Statement on Services for Older People makes for concerning reading. The population of the Haldar uh, University Health Board area already has a higher proportion of older people than the Wales average, and that already high proportion is predicted to increase dramatically in the coming years. And yet the number of people in the HDU area under the age of 65 years who provide unpaid care is predicted to de decrease significantly in the next 10 to 15 years and it is already proving very difficult to recruit paid carers. It is a job not well paid with enormous time pressures, very often they're not paid for the distance of travel that they do um, and it is not often regarded well by other people within society. What are you as the Welsh Government going to do to raise and improve the caring status so that we can get more carers and what can you do, do you think your government could do to encourage and reward those people who do provide unpaid care selflessly day in and day out for their loved ones? Well, well the member will know that uh, unfair uh, employment practices, she's identified them, are bad for individuals. Uh, that's why we're taking action on zero hours contracts through guidance, through procurement and through our consultation on proposed regulations for social uh, care. Uh, it's hugely important, of course, that the, uh, the caring profession is valued, hugely important that they are rewarded appropriately, and that, of course, uh, is what the uh, regulations intend to do. Question 7, Vicky Howell. Will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government is supporting serving and retired armed forces personnel and their families in the Cynan Valley? Well, we've made it clear in uh, taking Wales forward that our commitment is to support both serving and ex-service personnel and their families so that they are not disadvantaged by their service. First Minister, on Saturday I will be attending RCT's Armed Forces Day event in Aberdeen, and I want to applaud RCT for their proactive approach in this issue, as councils have such a key role in delivering many of the frontline services personnel and their families rely on. The minutes of the expert group on the needs of the armed forces community in Wales notes plans to review the work of armed forces champions. Are you able to give us an update on this important work, how it supports our armed forces and meets their needs? Yes, I was at Armed Forces Day myself, um, our Welsh National Armed Forces Day in, in Caerphilly on, on Saturday. Uh, very important to, uh, to support that event. I know I have to say that the, um, the one event that stands out in my mind is a gentleman in uniform coming towards me, shaking my hand and saying, well done on the election result, uh, not realising that uh, Alan Keynes was standing next to me. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll take that for, uh, for what it is. But I can say, in terms of the issue itself, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Children, who chairs, of course, uh, the Armed Forces Expert Group, will be meeting with local authority champions uh, following the summer recess to discuss their role and the support they can give to the Armed Forces community in their areas, building on, of course, what we have already done as a government. David Melding. And First Minister, you know that Nankaro has recently been chosen as the base for the new 24-hour 
a helpline for armed forces veterans. This would be a great help all over Wales, uh, but also RCT and Cannon Valley in particular. Now, this is part of the 2014 Veterans Transition Review, which also recommended that local authorities conduct an audit of their social housing provision and see how that does serve armed forces personnel and, and veterans. Uh, do you agree that uh, Welsh local authorities should take part in this review and get on with that work as soon as possible? Yes, well, it's very important that they're able to uh, assess the need in their areas, particularly in terms of housing. Uh, we have developed the next service personnel housing referral pathway to help them and their families make an informed choice of their accommodation needs on transferring back into civilian uh, life. On top of that, to further promote the pathway, we have developed advice cards for ex-service personnel sleeping rough. Too many, I'm afraid, but we know that the, that the, the problem is there uh, with leaflets and uh, posters. And these publications will include contact details for the new Veterans Gateway service. It's designed to be a one-stop shop for veterans and family members to access services and support in one place. So much has been done already, not just to provide information for those who need housing uh, and are looking for housing, but those who are in desperate need and are sleeping rough. Neil McAvoy. Uh, First Minister, will, will your government legislate to guarantee housing and health care for veterans who have seen active service? Well, we, we've done much uh, so far. £585,000 per annum is provided to Veterans NHS uh, Wales, a unique service, the only one of its kind in the UK. We know that over 2,900 referrals have been received in that time. Service personnel in need of particular specialist health care can access the Fast Track Referral Pathway. That's a joint initiative between the Defence Medical Service and NHS Wales, which prioritises access to secondary care, and that ensures that serving members of the armed forces are not disadvantaged by their service and have the same standard of access to health care as that received by any other resident in Wales. Question 8, Mohamed Ashkar. What action will the Welsh Government take to improve the lives of, of people with learning disabilities in Wales over the next 12 months, please? Well, a learning disability advisory group is established. It will advise on a uh, reviewed strategic action plan. Uh, learning disability is a priority for the regional partnership boards as well. And, of course, in 2016, we extended the integrated care fund to include support for people with the learning disability. Thank you for the reply, First Minister. A recent report by Aston said that the colleges should do more to prepare young people with learning disabilities for independent living. They found that only a few set realistic goals to help students develop their communication and work skills and call for colleges to set individual learning plans and to design programs that challenge people more. What action will the West government take in view of Aston's findings <coughs> to help and support students with learning disabilities to achieve their full potential in life. Yeah, yeah. Well, he will know that the response to Aston's recommendations was published last week, but I can say in 2015 to 16, for example, we invested over 140,000 on a project to support workforce capacity building in the FE sector, with a particular emphasis on increasing access for young people with complex learning disabilities. Uh, we are also investing an additional £250,000 uh, during 2016, or have invested an additional £250,000 for 2016-17 to 17 for a project to improve the quality of teaching and learning in the independent living skills learning area, on top of, of course, the response that we've already given. Here we're Anka Davis. The First Minister will know that the Welsh Government's strategies depend very much on frontline delivery very often from uh, third sector organisations. So within the Bridgend and Ogmore area, it's organisations like Drive, like Caltrevi, Camry, and like Myrus, and also BCBC's supported live-in service. All of these play a key role in enabling people with disabilities to live independently at home or close to home. So what more can the Welsh Government do, not only at a strategic level, but working in partnership with those organisations and with local authorities to deliver that support for independent living? Well, the Learning Disability Advisory Group uh, was set up in 2012. Uh, its purpose is to inform learning disability policy within the context of the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 and to provide advice to the Welsh Ministers on learning disability issues. The group is made up uh, of learning disabled people, third sector organisations working in the field and health and social care representatives. Alongside that, a learning disability strategic action plan is being developed following the review of learning disability that's currently being undertaken. Question now, Sean. Question 9, Sean Gwynllian. 
Will the First Minister make a statement on business rates in the community energy sector? Well, in 2017 to 2018, more than £210 million of relief is being provided to help ratepayers with their non-domestic rates. These reliefs are available to all eligible ratepayers who meet the criteria, including community energy projects. On Saturday, we launched two um, hydro energy programs in Arvon. Anian Avon is already in operation, and I'm very pleased that we have three schemes that harnesses one of our most reliable natural resources, namely water, and that the profits generated are spent on projects in the community and bring benefits to local people. But unfortunately, the process of re-evaluating rates has created great concern in this sector and is likely to prevent development in the future. Scotland has introduced a package of rate relief for such schemes clearly showing their support for this sector. Now, can you commit that the Welsh Government will also introduce a similar package of rate relief which will bring greater assurances to community energy programmes across Wales? Well, of course, there is a scheme already in place in order to ensure that there is relief given to companies on rates, and we wish to work with the sector to ensure to explore what kind of support can be given. And of course, we want to ensure that the sector grows. It's difficult to know which individual factors affecting the companies that the member has alluded to may be and what kind of experience they may have had. But if she wishes to write to me with uh, their story, I'd be very happy to respond. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, First Minister, we know that uh, many of those who have developed these community uh, hydro projects are very, very worried uh, about these huge increases. Uh, now, as the uh, member for Aberdeen has alluded to, the Scottish Government has actually uh, said that it will uh, have 100% uh, business rates relief for these projects. Uh, and even uh, the... the uh, uh, government in England has committed uh, that uh, not, it will not cost them more than £600 increases. Can we have those assurances from the Welsh Government that we will put those sort of uh, rate reliefs into place? Well, we already have a, a rate relief uh, system for non-domestic rates uh, that is more generous uh, than, than is the case, for example, in England. More businesses are covered by that relief scheme than is the case uh, there. Uh, I can also say that WEFO has put out a, a call for organisations to submit proposals to benefit from £14 million pounds of EU funds for small-scale renewable energy initiatives. £10 million is available to West Wales and the Valleys and £4 million to East Wales. And any organisation, whether they are public, private or third sector, can apply I can say that the deadline for proposals is uh, the 30th of June, so not a huge amount of time left, uh, but nevertheless uh, that, um, that offer has been uh, on the table for some time. Thank you, First Minister. In accordance with Standing Order 12.69, I have accepted a request from the First Minister to move a motion for an urgent debate, and I call on Carwyn Jones to move the motion. Well, yesterday, yes, sir, we saw an announcement uh, of a financial deal between the Conservative Party and the Democratic Unionist Party that has caused widespread concern, not just amongst parties in this chamber, but amongst the general public in Wales. Of particular concern is the amount, a billion pounds, and also that extra money is being provided for health and education, areas that are normally provided for via the Barnet formula. Why, for example, there are health pressures in Northern Ireland and not in Wales, as the UK Government sees it, we will have to uh, get an explanation as to why that is nor is it the case that a comparison can be made with city deals. This is a billion pounds over two years. Uh, city deals in Wales deliver something like 60 million a year or 120 million pounds over the same period. It is only right, given the effect on the finances uh, of uh, Wales, members in this chamber have the opportunity to express a view uh, and express their concerns about the deal that was done yesterday. And so uh, I formally uh, move the appropriate motion under the uh, standing order in order for that debate to take place. A question the proposal is to agree the motion for an urgent debate. Does any member object? The 
motion for an urgent debate is therefore agreed in accordance with the relevant standing order and as we have now resolved that this debate will take place I can confirm that it will take place later this afternoon following the stage four debate on the landfill disposals tax Wales bill. The next item on our agenda is the business statement and announcement and I call on the Leader of the House.